Welcome back to Morning Trade Live on the Schwab Network. I'm Oliver Rennick, and we are broadcasting here from the Morning Star Investment Conference in Chicago, Illinois at Navy Pier. Our first guest is Warren Pearson, co-CIO at Baird Funds. We're going to be talking a lot of bonds this morning. Warren, great to have you on. Oliver, good morning. Good to be here. Yeah, we're on the early shift as uh, they're just getting settled in here this morning. Uh, but I'm sure you're going to be pretty busy because uh, everyone is certainly uh, still focusing on Fed, trying to think about how to put bonds in their portfolio. Did they just lock in yield? Do they hunt for yield? What's sort of your guys' general take here on uh, how to think about bonds? Yeah, we're, we're amazed by the, I guess, the preoccupation of what the Fed is going to do. And we think the Fed has done a, a really good job navigating a tough environment. And, and eventually they will ease. But our message is, don't get too caught up and you know, don't be stymied by all of that uncertainty. Bond yields are attractive, nominally they're attractive, real yields are positive, and when you look at the prospects for bonds based upon those yields compared to other asset classes, we think there's pretty good value really across the curve. For a lot of people locking in, uh, you know, four and a half or five percent uh, was a pretty sure thing and uh, a welcome trade uh, for those that just don't want to lose money and that had been looking for, you know, a decade of kind of lost bond returns. And then we get this huge stock market run up. How did that complicate things in terms of asset allocation, in terms of what choices? Some people then look and they go, oh, well, if I just stuck in the S&P, then I, you know, I, I'd be ripping it up 20% or yeah. so. Uh, you know, how does that kind of factor into the, to the allocation conversation? No, I think you're right. People have been surprised at how strong equities are. But when you look back over the last decade when interest rates were artificially low, our experience is that most of our investors, their allocation to core fixed income had been well below normal levels. So we think it's it's appropriate that they look at increasing a bit. We're not saying go back to where they were 20 years ago, but because of the value in bonds. So I think maybe there's, you know, investors have thought, boy, I thought it'd be, it was going to be great to increase the allocation of bonds, but stocks keep running. But again, we'd still say there's good value. Um, you know, it sounds like the pathetic plea of a bond manager, but it's just because of the relative value in bonds. Bonds are worth looking at, for sure. Well, it's, it's a good point, too, that people, it uh, feels like uh, allocated away from uh, the asset class, particularly after 2022. And uh, as traders, we talk a lot about the kind of good is bad, bad is good scenario, where you had this uh, really twisted relationship between bonds and stocks in 22, where they both got hammered together, didn't bonds didn't really do their job to hedge, but are we at a point where they do work and they do yeah. hedge? And is that something that yep. depends though on economic weakness? We don't think so. And absolutely the difference between now and say 2021 is the level of interest rates. And the reasons bonds, you're right, bonds didn't provide as much of a hedge is because we were starting at such a low income level. Now we've added 300 plus basis points. When you're looking at a, you know, our bond portfolios are yielding, you know, five-ish percent across the board. That's sort of the raw yield. That provides a really good cushion. So and, and when we say there's value in the bond market, it's not because we think there's some imminent decline in interest rates. Okay. Um, that could happen, but it, you know, it, I think we could see a period of relative stability. And you know, the 10 year has been kind of bopping between four and a quarter and four and three quarters in that range. Um, we think that could continue. It's just the overall level of interest rates is so much higher than it was four years ago. That's why we think there's good value. You're not staring over that cliff anymore when you're at near zero rates, right. where you just kind of know, well, I guess the inverse of a cliff, where you kind of just know that eventually it's going to come back. At this point now, you have a little bit better of a starting point to feel some security. Absolutely. That, and you look at, I mean, year to date uh, through the end of May, you look at a lot of the bond indices, the full market indices had negative returns, just marginally negative. Investors weren't that concerned about it. If you look at a 12-month trailing return, that gives you a better indication of the power of that income. And the point is that, you know, while investors might see negative returns in bonds, they're not that worried because they feel the power of that income kind of on a month-by-month -month basis. People are owning bonds for the more traditional reasons that bonds generate income. Yeah. And now there's a significant income that investors are really liking. Thinking about directionality and kind of just thinking about the tenure for a moment, as you pointed out, it's been kind of bouncing around without no Fed meeting in August. And without, it seems, data corroborating a cut uh, next month, does that mean maybe we just kind of put the Fed conversation to the side for three months? And what does a bond market do really without any major potential for central bank activity for a stretch here till September? I mean, that's a pretty unique window yeah. of inactivity. Well, and, and if you look at the, the Fed's target rate, we've kind of come up, you know, as I said, we're going to raise it up above 5%. Now it's been stable there. So that raises the uncertainty. Why are they going to ease right away? We think they're going to be pretty patient. They really turned the corner on inflation. Um, you know, inflation isn't the problem that it was when it was above four and five percent. You know, and we've said that last mile getting inflation from three to two is going to be hard. And whether they'll ever be successful at that, we'll see. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, 
kind of reduce things to long-term growth potential of our economy, we think is probably 2%. Inflation somewhere between 2 and 3%. Ten-year treasury probably between 4 and 5%. If inflation is closer to 2, then you four, a ten-year treasury probably closer to 4. If it sticks closer to 3, then the, the ten-year probably closer to 5%. Okay. And that's what you've seen. You know, is it sometimes it looks like, wow, they're going to have success and inflation is going to come down to 2 and you right. see it head towards 4. And it sticks around. And then all of a sudden, well, maybe it won't. And so then it goes back up. And that's kind of that range we've been stuck in. Do you think that's something that could hold for a bit? I think it could. You know, there's a lot of wild cards. We've got elections coming up, not only in the U.S., but U.K., France. You know, what's going on, just the global uh, the uncertainty, geopolitics. I mean, what's going on, you know, Ukraine, in Israel, so much uncertainty. But again, we just advise investors, don't let that stymie you from taking advantage of the the yield that, or the, the opportunities that the bond market presents. How much visibility do you feel we have on the impact of the presidential cycle coming up? It seems like right now it's, gen, it's been generally a little bit more mudslinging than economic promises, but it feels like once we get in a couple months closer to election, that's when the economic promises start coming down. Is it generally just both candidates are pro-cyclical and going to try and persuade the American public with money, stimulus? Do you feel that these are things that could kind of rock the boat in any way on the general range-bound nature of some of the things we're talking about right now? It's a really good question. And I think we've had, in, you know, in, in recent years, you know, looking back four or five years, we've had a lot of stimulus. I mean, the fiscal stimulus has been pretty profound. I mean, right. off the charts. Right. And, and that's really what caused the inflation. Hasn't and, stopped you know, them from you're promising more. $5 trillion <laughs> into a $20 trillion economy, you know, quickly it's going to cause inflation. So that... You know, I think what, what could happen is after the election passes, maybe there could be some settling in and that, you know, some of these economic forces that are at play might be bigger than politics alone. Okay. Thinking about credit for a sec, uh, uh, if we kind of switch into that uh, mode, is obviously you guys have a lot of different funds that you're offering to clients. And one of the things uh, it seems like from your strategy is to not hunt too far for yield. Is that obviously we talked about that from the kind of treasury standpoint fixed income offering, but what does that imply from a credit standpoint? Is that not to take risk on the credit side? Yeah, credit, credits, we like credit. We like the credit fundamentals. They're pretty solid overall, but credit spreads are pretty tight. And part of that is just driven by the interest in bonds. There's been a lot of flows into the market. It's kept spreads, you know, on a year-to-date basis, spreads have come in and investment grade credit somewhat close to all-time tights. So when we say there's good value in the bond market, it's more just the level of interest rates. We're fairly conservatively positioned. We do like the prospects for credit, so we're overweight credit, but not in a huge way, and we're taking more of that exposure shorter on the curve. So, you know, I, I say on a scale of one to 10, the risk profile, risk profile of our book of business overall, one being very conservative, 10 being very aggressive, we're probably somewhere between a three and a four right now. Really, okay. Um, you back up a year, and we were probably somewhere between a five and a six, not wildly aggressive, but as right. spreads have come back, we've let some of that exposure roll off. We see some a bit more value in securitized sectors. Those spreads haven't tightened as much. CMBS, I mean, a lot of concerns about commercial real estate. Right. That's really focused more on uh, you know office space. So we see some well diversified collateral pools. If you stay senior in the capital structure, we see some pretty good opportunities on the securitized side. Are there any hard no's, as you mentioned, in uh, commercial uh, real estate? Uh, it, you know, and when you say a three to uh, three to four on the risk spectrum, it sounds yeah. like there's some minefields. Maybe you want to ignore yeah, and we, dodge. And, and those are not just recent no's. I mean, we always stay up in the capital structure, AAA rated, the most senior. We look for 30% credit enhancement in our CMBS structures. The one thing we have always stayed away from is the SASB or single asset, single borrowers. And that's what's really grabbing the headlines. You know, the loans that have uh, defaulted where there's real challenges are more in those, you know, what were signature properties where there's one property, one loan, and now that's a challenge. We stay away from that. So that's been kind of a hard no for us. Okay. Uh, any fears of a big credit wall, a big loan wall, some of them talked about? You know, that certainly people talk about the refinancing wall. Right. I think that's probably going to hit the high yield sector before it hits investment grade. So, again, the fundamentals in high yield we're not terribly concerned about, pretty solid overall. But the supply demand technicals, there hasn't been a lot of supply in the high yield, and that's what has caused those spreads to come in. So we think that refinancing wall is a lot of those loans have to come to market. There could be some widening in our core plus fund where we can invest in high yield. We want to keep some powder dry. We've been unweight th or underweight there, so probably see some more attractive opportunities down the road. More great stuff. Uh, fantastic conversation. Good talking. Thanks, Oliver. Appreciate your time yeah. and a good way to start off our discussion here for a week that's going to get some economic data, uh, hopefully getting bonds moving. Warren Pearson, co-CIO at Baird Fund.